Great. All right, Simon, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you. Hi, I'm Simon. Um, I'm from Switzerland. First, maybe some words about me. Um, oops, sorry. Um, I started my IT career uh, already a long time ago in 1995. As you can see in the timeline, I'm in Java development for more than 20 years now, and I'm an active Java uh, community member. I'm helping to organize Java User Group Switzerland, for example, or working in two expert groups of the Java community process. Uh, and I'm also a teacher at the university in Bern, have my own company since uh, 12 years. And uh, as you can see on the right hand side, I started with Vadin in 2019. So that's not entirely true because I used Vadin in the past as well, but not as intensive as I do right now, because currently I'm working on a customer project for uh, around two and a half years and I'm using Vadin every day. And that's probably also the reason why I'm invited here. And I'm very happy uh, to be part of the developer day uh, for flooding today. Uh, if you want to reach out, you can find me on Twitter or also send me uh, an email at uh, the address here. I have some code to share. You will get the link to the code as well at the end. I hope to show you a lot of code and not too much slides. And uh, yeah, let's go to the topic. Uh, as you can see, that's my current project I'm working on. So this is an ERP product that from a Swiss company. Um, the product is sold to um, small and medium businesses in Switzerland. For example, uh, companies that are selling office supplies are using uh, this application. And currently the application, this one is the new one. The old one was written in Oracle Forms. Uh, back in the days, the product is more than 30 years old already. And uh, but to be uh, relevant these days, it's no longer uh, enough to have like a desktop client to need some mobile client as well. And so they decided to move away from this Oracle Forms. And now we are working on the migration of Oracle Forms application uh, to a uh, modern web application made with, with Vadin. And uh, the important thing to show here on this screen is we have a lot of data. So this ERP system has around 2,000 tables. The, all the business logic is in, uh, also stored in the database, like functions, procedures, in packages, um, and uh, for sure also some uh, Java business code we are building. But at the end, uh, the UI more or less looks similar. Does uh, this screen here, for example, is from the price list module where you can uh, set price list create special prices for some products for the customers. And uh, what we see here, we see tables. So uh, if you're looking at a data-centric application, you usually have uh, components that are displaying more than just one record. And uh, if you look at Vadin, there are several of them. I brought some of the free components here. Uh, we have combo boxes, list box, selects, and we have what we've seen before, the grid and the tree grid. And now the question is, uh, how does the data come into this uh, multi-record uh, components? And uh, this is what I like to show you. And to show that, I created a small example. Uh, we have a simple uh, entity model. So we have a customer. Uh, the customer has a list of orders. An order has an order date and a list of order items. And the order item then has a quantity and the product. And at the end, the product has a name and the price. So that's a very uh, simple model. You can imagine a real uh, system um, is uh, the model much bigger. But this is enough to just show uh, this example. So what I did, uh, I created an application uh, with Vadin. And I started with an entity model. So we have the customer here, as you can see, with the list of orders. We have the order uh, with a lot, uh, with the list of items, and the order item with the product, and the product with the price. And uh, the requirement from uh, my customer is I need to show uh, the customer's revenue in a table. So they want to see a table with all the customers with their revenue in total. 
So as I'm a Java developer, I could go ahead and uh, do that in Java. So what I did, I created the method here. That uh, method is called get revenue, and uh, it gets the orders, uh, uses a stream, then maps uh, the total amount of the order to a double and makes a sum at the end. The total amount here does more or less the same. It iterates over the items uh, and gets the price of the product and does a sum as well. So that's pretty easy. So I thought I created a table so we can create a, a loving grid. Uh, I add some columns, the ID of the customer, the first name, the last name, and the revenue. And then I need to get uh, the items. Uh, by the way, if you're using one in 14, and that's what I currently do, by the way, we are using the LTS version, not the newest one, uh, then this would look a bit different. But here we have set items uh, a bit. Uh, one in 17, uh, the whole data provider stuff changed. And now we have this nice set item uh, method where I can pass uh, just uh, find all method. And the find all method, by the way, comes from a custom repository, the custom repository. It's a JPA repository. That's why we have to find all method. And now I like to see that in action and start my application. So let's see if this works. Application started. Let's move over the browser. And now we are here. So uh, I have several versions of the same um, grid, by the way, just to show you. But I start with the customer revenue list. That's what I've shown you before. And then I, oh, have a problem. Now what's the problem? Let's have a look. Uh, what does it say? It says it cannot lazy initialize a collection. So that's a typical uh, pr uh, problem of Hibernate. So Hibernate has this concept of lazy loading. That means that's a performance optimization um, because you don't uh, always need like the collection of the orders if you're dealing with the customer. So Hibernate decides, oh, it's better to have this uh, one-to-many relationship lazy. So it gets reloaded if uh, someone tries to access uh, this list. But the problem is that uh, we are no longer uh, in the Hibernate session or in the JP Entity Manager, if you like to, if the, or when the, the data gets rendered in the UI. So we have a problem there. Uh, if you're a Spring user or Spring Boot user, you know since Spring Boot uh, 2.3, if I'm not wrong, there is an open session view pattern activated by default that overcomes this problem. But that's not a real solution. That's more kind of an anti-pattern because this means that probably the lazy loading will uh, take place in a different transaction and you may get some uh, inconsistent data. So I know that I can uh, change this behavior here and let's try, I can define here another fetch type eager. And this I have also to do here because this is the other uh, lazy loaded collection. If I miss that, it will uh, also fail again. And so let's try again with, uh, with the eager. Uh, and so I hope that uh, Hibernate will load all the data if I'm uh, executing find all. And let's see if this really works. So now let's try again, and now it works. But, uh, oh, what's happened now? Here you can see my console. There were a lot of SQL statements. And I can tell you it were about, I don't know. Let's see how if I can find out how many we had. Um, that again, and I show you a trick how you can get that. Uh, there is a property uh, that you can set in Spring Boot. It's called uh, Spring JPA Properties, and it's from Hibernate. It's Hibernate generates statistics, and I can set that to true. And so I 
rerun the application again. So it may print out how many statements get executed for, for that. So here's the application back again. And uh, let's see what happens now. It still runs forever, but I hope I will see the statistics at the end. And then we can go ahead and see that we had 3,107 SQL statements. So I tell you a secret, we have uh, 400 customers in the database. Um, here, by the way, I'm using Flyway to create the tables and to insert also some data. And if I open this one, IntelliJ uh, doesn't like it if I open this file because this file is a bit large. It has uh, 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 17,527 SQL statements. So I insert some test data. So the problem that we have now with this eager loading that uh, first of all, it creates a lot of SQL statements. This is so-called n plus one select problem because uh, what happens now is that uh, Hibernate doesn't do a join, by the way, if I use eager. Uh, Hibernate will load first all customers, then it will go to the order and uh, select for every customer. It creates a SQL statement to get the order. So we have one statement for the customer, 400 statements for the orders. Then it navigates to the order, and then we have, I don't know how many orders I have, but for every order, it will execute the SQL statement to get the order items. And that's probably not what we want. So that's, uh, first of all, it's a bad idea to have this. Um, this can be changed, by the way. We could use uh, something called entity graphs. That's a Hibernate-specific thing, or a JPA uh, standard, by the way, uh, to define how uh, to get the data so that it will not be uh, fetched eager with uh, separate statements, but with the join. Or we could uh, could use join fetch if we create uh, or we write the, the statement by our own. Now, that's uh, maybe one thing that we could do. But the other problem that we have here is it loads all the data. So if my user comes and just uh, clicks on custom revenue list, he just sees a handful of customers. So he don't need to, we don't need to load all the data. So let's uh, create a, a better um, version of that. And the better version means that we try to lazy load the data also with Vadin for the grid. Um, this we can see here. So set items is no longer find all, but it's a Lambda expression. Here we get the query inside and the find all method that we see here um, is now a different one because uh, this one has a pageable that is passed. We have a page request here and this page request uh, can be passed to find all here. That's the pageable interface. And this one comes from paging and sorting repository. That's because the JPA repository um, inherits from a list or from a, a hierarchy key of interfaces. And there we have a find all method that allows us uh, to pass paging information. And now this query object is quite interesting because this is a query object that gets passed to the set item method. The set item method here is no longer X list. So maybe we go back here. This set item method takes a collection, and this item, set item method in the second version takes um, sorry takes a so-called fetch callback. So this fetch callback then uh, gets this query, and uh, this query object now has several uh, properties that we can use to uh, improve um, the way the data is loaded. First of all. Uh, if you come from what in 14, there are uh, not uh, the same uh, properties, for example. So if you have a look here, again, we see that we get the page and the page size. That's uh, something that's perfect fit for Spring Data that was improved in what in 17. We also have, as you've seen before, 
an offset and a limit that could be used if you're doing pure SQL uh, statements, then it's uh, perfect because you can use uh, offset and limit. Also, if you're doing pure JPI, you could use uh, offset and limit. Uh, what you also get, and what we didn't talk about yet, is you get a sort order. So in my case here, I added uh, to ID, first name, and last name, the information that uh, the column will be sortable, and I passed the sort property. That's uh, just a marker. You can pass whatever you like to, to uh, find out uh, on what column the sort happened. And here is a, a uh, what in Spring Data Helper. That's, by the way, if you create uh, the project, uh, this one is not the modeling standard, but this comes from uh, this uh, AVADIN helper dependency. And there we have, for example, this uh, to Spring Data Sorter, because this is a very uh, common use case that we have here that we want to uh, transform the, the query sort order to a, a Spring Sort order. And now with this implementation here, that's the second one, customer revenue paging. Uh, you've seen the loading indicator is still there, and it's, but it's much better. So compared to that one, and if you we have a look here, this uh, runs forever. And if we hit here, it's a bit better. It just creates 300 and... Uh, 87 statements, but it's still a bit slow. The difference is that uh, now we have uh, just, we have a paging, um, there's default page size, I didn't configure anything. And so um, Vadin is just calling or getting some of the data, not all. But there is still a problem. So that's great now, because if you're coming from Vadin 14, you see that I just have a fetch callback. If you know Vadin 14, you know that uh, with uh, Vadin versions uh, 14 and prior versions, you have also to pass a count callback. So that's no longer necessary. Um, and that's also a good thing, because in my case here, I could easily provide a count. And, uh, but if you're getting the data, for example, from a REST API, then you usually don't have a count. So you don't know how many elements you get, but maybe your REST API allows paging. So you're good with, uh, with this one, where you just have uh, a fetch callback. But the problem with only having a fetch callback is that, so you now have, please have a look at uh, the scroll bar on the right side. What happens with the scroll bar if I scroll down? You see it, it jumped up, now it's smaller than before. And uh, if I go there, uh, it jumps up and so on. So the problem here is that uh, Vadin doesn't know how many elements that we really have. And if you want to improve that, you have uh, two options. The first option could be you can't provide any count. So you don't know how to count uh, the elements. And uh, there is something new like, uh, you can set an estimate of the count. So first of all, something is also new uh, with what in 17, you see that the set items return a data view. In that case, a grid lazy data view, the grid lazy data view or the data view has some uh, in interesting um, methods on it. Uh, for example, you can refresh an item or you can uh, refresh all items. You don't need the data provider that you were used to uh, use in in what in 14 and older, but now you have a data view, and on this data view you can set the item count estimate. So let's try this one. That's the one with the estimate, and now we still have the same loading behavior. So still 387 uh, uh, SQL statements, but you see the scroll bar is smaller and has the right size, because I know now uh, it's 400, but that's just uh, because I know it. Usually you don't know how many elements you have in the database, but it improves the handling on that. Uh, if you want to make it perfect, you can uh, post, uh, you can add uh, the count callback as well. So here we have uh, this count callback. So uh, we have a set item method that uh, allows us to pass a fetch callback and a count callback. 
And here in my case, I'm passing the count of the customers. Um, to be true, to be honest, this is not correct, you know, because uh, the find all here may work now currently because I have this eager loading. So find all will return all customers. But if I would do that with a join, with an inner join, then I probably wouldn't get all customers. Maybe we have customers that never bought anything in our store, so they don't have any orders. So the count is not correct in that case. But for my case, currently, that's good enough. So let's get back to the slides and uh, check uh, this data provider thing. We've seen uh, already two of them. Um, we've seen the different uh, types here on the left and on the right side, we have a in-memory data provider, that's the one that we used first. So there's a list data provider can pass a collection to set items, we've seen that. So this will create this list data provider. This list data provider or the in-memory data provider should only be used if you have a handful of items. So you shouldn't use that. Maybe 400 will be not too bad if you load it better than I did, then it uh, wouldn't uh, load a lot of data in memory. But if you have thousands of data records, then maybe it's not a good idea to have that in memory. Because of that, you have this so-called uh, backend data provider on the right hand side, on the left hand side, and this will uh, have this ability to to the fetch and the call call add count callbacks uh, to get a lazy loading mechanism. Here in the center of the diagram, it's uh, the hierarchical the hierarchical data provider because we also have components. That's the uh, tree grid where data uh, in a tree is displayed and uh, this hierarchical data provider comes also in two flavors. You can have it with, uh, with an in-memory data provider or with a, with a fetch or a lazy loaded data provider. By the way, that's only a simplified model. You have a lot of more uh, intermediate uh, components here or classes and interfaces. So to summarize the first step, China. we saw that uh, in-memory is maybe okay for small amount of data, but not in our case, we maybe want to improve that. And that's why we have this lazy callback method where we can pass this uh, fetch callback. Uh, Simon? Yep. Yeah. I think Matti has a question or a comment. Yeah, yeah, or, or just a comment actually. I noticed that there was some questions on the on the chat about the a in helper that, that was mentioned because you use this one handy helper that kind of transforms the voting query method into spring data query method. Uh, there is actually a similar method in, in, in the voting spring these days. So if you okay. use the latest versions of voting major, it is there. So you don't need this uh, helper lab library just for this case anymore. So just use the latest version and then you have almost the same kind of method, which is doing exactly the same thing. I know that because I actually wrote that piece of code. My team is super scared usually when I'm writing some code, but this is, this is my contribution during this. Okay. this, this <laughs> great. I didn't know that, so that's great. I will change um, the example after the talk for sure. So let's get back to the, the query object. I already mentioned it. Uh, get offset and limit is clear page size and uh, page and page size as well. Uh, what I like to mention is the query sort order. Um, you get a list uh, of sort orders. The sort order also have uh, the information uh, which column is sorted plus in which direction. So you get ascending or descending and it's a list. So the grid, for example, in Vadin allows multi-sort. So you can sort at the same time by multiple columns. That's why there is a, is a list. There's a, another method on this query object. It's called get filter, and it returns an optional filter. Uh, I will show you an example with this filter, but uh, this is deprecated now since Vadin 17. People who use Vadin 14 know this filter stuff, so you can filter on a data provider directly. Uh, today, this is done a bit different, but I will show you uh, later the stuff. Here we have uh, the sort order. Also here, still these two spring data sorter example. Uh, this will be changed because as Martin, as Martin said, 
uh, this is now integrated. Now, again, uh, this lazy data view that was improved with the count callback, uh, some words about performance. The problem or the good thing about the count is the, the better behavior of the scroll bar, as we have seen. But there also come some disadvantages with that because depending on the query you are doing, you have to create the same query to count. And if this query to get the data is complex and slow for some reason, maybe it's not optimized, then you should optimize before you, you remove the count. But if it's not possible to optimize the query, you maybe should not use count because then you will always get the count query at the beginning that is slow as the data query. So you may have uh, double the time for the first request because it counts first and then it, it fetches the data. So it depends a bit on uh, what you do. But if you do easy stuff, uh, so displaying a list of employees, for example, or something like that, so there's nothing against this count uh, because it may um, improve uh, the, the behavior. So the count estimate we had. So now let's, uh, before we go to, to filtering, let's see how we can improve that because we still have a lot of queries here. We have 404. JDBC statements, that's probably not the way to go. And uh, there is a, a great thing, or there are various great things with, uh, with uh, JPA and with Spring Data. Uh, one thing that I could do, and that's what I did, is I could use uh, so-called constructor expression. So instead, letting uh, Spring Data generate uh, the query, I do the query myself. And uh, the only thing that I have to do, I have to write the query. By the way, uh, if you're not using Java 16, that is text blocks, or that's called text blocks here. You can have multi-line strings with, uh, with Java 16. And it, this is very handy for exactly this case, like uh, if you're embedding uh, SQL statements or JPQL uh, statements. And what I did here, I created two queries. So I have a count query here on the lower side and here on the upper uh, part of uh, the method out uh, of the class, I have a, a method that is pageable and has a name. So I will show you filtering as well. So what I do here is I do uh, select from the customer, join orders and items. And because I join here now, I will probably not get all customers because I don't know if all customers have orders. So that's why I have a account query on the other side that does the similar thing as, as the, the fetch query at the end. And then I do some um, filtering by first name and last name, and I group this by the customer. And then the interesting part is this here on top, because I do not return a entity. In my opinion, JPA entities shouldn't, shouldn't use if you're searching data. So usually uh, if you're looking for data in the database, you will get back kind of a projection. So you will not need the whole entity if you're getting a list of, of data because usually you want to display it in a grid like we do, or you want to send it over uh, HTTP in a REST response, for example. So there is no need to create entities because entities have, uh, for example, um, relationships that are lazy loaded. You have to, to walk around, work around uh, this problem that we have seen before. So it's probably better just to create a projection. One way to do that is with constructor, ex constructor expression from JPA. It's called constructor expression because of the new keyword here. So with the new keyword and the full qualified name, uh, by the way, you have to fully qualify the name because this is not an entity. If you have entities, you don't need to full qualify it. Uh, we can create an instance or instances of customer info. And it's also called constructor expression because all the attributes that I'm passing here uh, are sent to the constructor of customer info. That's the way it works. It works with DTOs. It works with, with the normal classes. Uh, if you're using uh, spring data, you may also have this so-called interface projection that 
does similar, but uh, that's done. That's maybe not uh, as handy as this one. Because let's have a look what this is. This is also something new from Java 16. That's a record. Uh, so a record is an immutable data structure, like uh, a value object, where you simply have a constructor like this. And then you have methods to get the uh, properties. So you don't have a get ID or a get last name method. You will get an ID and the last name method. I omitted the get from the Java Beans convention. I don't know why, but uh, it, uh, maybe it's a it's, uh, better style today. And then you can use this, this customer info record directly. And now let's see how we can use that. We have here uh, another version. And in this version here, uh, the grid now is of type uh, customer info, no longer customer. And here we see that uh, I use ID, first name, last name, and revenue. And here you see the, that's maybe an advantage of, uh, of the records without uh, the Java Beans convention or without the getter. I have customer info, ID, first name, last name, revenue. That's better readable than if it's uh, get ID, get first name, get last name, get revenue. And that's more or less the only change. Uh, what I also do, I do filtering. So I added the text field where I can filter and I have a value change listener. And here I call a method called load data and pass the value of uh, the text field that's taken from the event. And load data um, creates uh, these two fetch and count callbacks and passes, first of all, the name um, that is uh, in the text field. And then it uses for sure uh, page and page size and also the, the, the sort information to sort the data. And now let's look uh, how this behaves. Um, that's the one here. If I click here, you see that it executed and it executed exactly one JDBC statement. So that's not entirely true, that's the fetch that just executed one. If I go here up, I see another one. That's the count. That's, here we see the count. And here we see uh, the fetch callback. And I think that's kind of a rule of thumb or a best practice. However, in my opinion, uh, if you have a list of data in a grid, then you should only see one or two statements. You shouldn't see a lot of statements because if you're seeing a lot of statements, you have this n plus one uh, problem. I also work for customers that have uh, problems with performance, mostly with uh, applications using Hibernate. And there, uh, the first thing that I do, and that's something you should do as well, you should uh, first display all the SQL statements that are getting executed. You can do that by a locker. There's a, this logger here, that's the org Hibernate SQL logger. You set it to debug and you see all SQL statements. And the other thing that you should do is generate statistics during development. Then you see if you have this n plus one bombs that maybe should could, sol uh, could generate the problem. The worst thing that I ever seen in my career was an, an application for the Swiss government. There you could uh, search for people. And if you entered uh, some uh, data and hit, hit search, then uh, you get around six or 7,000 SQL statements executed. Uh, but what you see on the screen, you, you saw 20 uh, records in the grid because they did paging, but first of all, they did paging only on the client side. And secondly, they had uh, this n plus one uh, problem multiple times in their data model. So take care if you're using Hibernate for uh, selecting data. Uh, so please have a look and make sure that there are as few statements as possible in the output. So that's filtering. Filtering has also another flavor, uh, but this is now deprecated, but just for completion uh, for the Vadin 14 user. If you want to do that in the past, you had to create a filter. Um, let's but here you have to create a um, data provider that allows filtering. So we created a, a data provider here with the callback. So that's not different from what we do now. We have uh, the same queries, so the find and the count. 
but we have a method with configure filter and this will create a configurable filter data provider. And this one has a type more. So this string here is the type of the filter. So now you can see that, uh, why there is a um, filter uh, on the query object because now I can use set filter on the data provider. And then uh, if I do the query here on top, I can get this uh, information from the filter. So that's the old way to do, by the way. Uh, I asked Mati because why this is there and why there is no filter anymore and why query has still this filter uh, property. The point is it doesn't matter. So it doesn't matter. In my opinion, this looks nice here with the filter, but it doesn't matter if you create with every filter uh, this uh, thing from new. So you create, uh, you call set items past uh, these two callbacks. It doesn't matter if you do it like this or if you lose uh, the legacy filtering. That's the, the point. Now, there is another uh, method if you're using this callback data provider or another attribute that, or a parameter, sorry, that you can pass. Uh, it's the so-called identifier getter. And I like to show you uh, this, I think I have it. No, I don't have it here. Um, sometimes, or, or let's start different. What in use is equals? So you have equals and hash code. And uh, if you want to uh, identify an object, an object in a list, for example, uh, equals is used. What in is not different from that. But what if you can't implement equals? So if you have a, a class that's not your class and this class doesn't has an equals method, how do you know um, which one is the identity of, of this object or which attribute or which attributes? And therefore you can pass a third parameter to the callback data provider. Uh, we have the fetch callback, we have the count callback, and we have uh, the so-called identifier getter. That's a method that you can uh, pass that will be called if what it needs to get an ID. And here, for example, uh, we have the employee and uh, pass get ID. So we use get ID for that purpose. You could also have uh, multiple attributes if you like to. Um, that uh, depends on on your use case at the end. And here is are some methods. Uh, that you can get on the data view uh, class. You have refresh all, so you can reload the data or you can refresh a specific item that is very handy if you want to uh, reload the data after you have edited, for example, one record in a dialogue or in another, in a form, and you want just to refresh uh, this. There are other methods on the data view that are interesting. You can get the next element, for example, from the selected element that's also possible. And uh, by the way, just uh, as an addition, I created uh, another view that I didn't talk about. I uh, use Chook here. So if you don't like Hibernate uh, and uh, like SQL, for example, uh, you may have the possibility today to have these text blocks in Java 16 and no longer use string concatenation in any way but it's not type safe. And that's why I brought in Juke. I don't want to talk about Juke, but just a sneak preview. Juke uh, has a class so-called uh, DSL context. That's the domain specific language class. And with that, you can uh, formulate uh, a SQL statement. And what you see here in between uh, the constants, these are generated uh, this is a generate meta model from Chook. So Chook, for example, takes my um, where do I have it? Uh, my SQL um, TDL statement, for example, with all the elements, analyzes this, and then at the end it generates some data. So we have uh, as some sources. So we have, for example, for every table, um, we get we get the class. And then we have records to read the data or write the data. And that's a perfect fit again for um, Wadin because now we can uh, use the fetch provider with Juke. And what we get back is, uh, for example, the same customer info. So here we have a fetch in two, so that 
does the mapping more or less the same as the constructor uh, expression does, or we can, can use directly a, a custom record that is also generated. The nice thing about that is if you want to create a condition, uh, you can uh, write the condition because these are kind of predicates that you can join then with and, and or whatever. So we get a nice syntax to, for, to, to define your conditions for, for the SQL statement, for example. But that's just an idea. I like Juke. I use it a lot in my current project because we have so many tables and we have a lot of store procedures and functions and it's very easy to access that with Juke. But coming back to the example, I made the last example with an employee so uh, this employee has a supervisor and some uh, directs and uh, the boss on top has no supervisor for sure. And uh, this is now a tree and we want to display the data like in a tree. So we have here the employee tree, that's the oil lane is the boss. And then we have several uh, or two uh, managers with uh, both five employees at the end. And now the question is, how do we display this? And this can be easily done with a hierarchical data provider. And uh, here we also have uh, this example in the employee tree view. And here we see we create a uh, hierarchical data provider with the type. And then we have uh, four or three methods to implement. We have to implement get child count. So that's pretty easy. I count uh, uh, the elements with uh, where the supervisor is null. In my case, it's just one. And then I count by supervisor to find, uh, to get the child. Here with, uh, with the has children method, I uh, count by supervisor again. If it's bigger than zero, then there are children. And the fetch callback at the end uh, gets the data. If the parent is null, then it's uh, it's top level. We get uh, the supervisors by null, and otherwise we get uh, the supervisor by its parent. So it's super easy to create a tree uh, based data structure and to display data like this. That's the same. And even here we have uh, also the query. So I don't use paging by the way here because I know that I don't have a lot of data. But if I had a lot of data, I can use the query because it's the same. Uh, it also extends query. So we have offset and limit page and page size that we can use directly uh, in the hierarchic, hierarchical data provider as well. And to summarize, maybe take care if you use JPA and Hibernate. I see so many uh, performance issues with that not because Hibernate is bad. So I don't want to, to make the impression that Hibernate is a bad thing, but Hibernate comes with some uh, features, I would call it, like lazy loading, uh, that you have to be aware how it works to get the best out of Hibernate. Because Hibernate is great if you want to uh, load and write uh, tree-based data structures or graph uh, based data structures, then it's a good thing. But you should really consider using projection. And Java records with the Java 16, that's a great thing. That's a perfect fit for Hibernate to read read-only data that you want to display. For example, in a grid, that works very well. And uh, to go back to Vadin, Vadin is really a great uh, framework and is especially great framework if you have data-centric applications. So if you build something like the ERP or a list of customer, list of employees, whatever, uh, Vadin works very well. And not to talk about uh, um, all the thing with, uh, with forms and binding, just uh, the existing of this lazy data providers that reduces memory, uh, enhances the performance because it doesn't load all data. That's really, really great thing. And again, uh, to finish my talk, check the SQL statements. So you should always have uh, the Hibernate locker turned on if you're developing to see if you produce the n plus one select problem anywhere in your in your code. Yes, that's all from my side. Are there any questions? Thank you, Simon. That was a very good uh, presentation. Uh, but what you were the first ever uh, external guest to have in. Dev Day event as a speaker, that is. 
So thank you very much for, for joining us on, on this event. Uh, I really enjoyed the presentation. Um, I hope we can get you in future editions of the, of the event. Uh, on the questions side, well, here's one that's not very technical, but uh, more of an opinion. Juke versus query DSL, which is better, why? Oh, that's very simple. It's Juke. Uh, the, the reason why it's, as a first thing that we have to, to consider is Juke is maintained, actively maintained, and query DSL not. Query DSL has a problem uh, because query, they had a problem with uh, with the committers because they are all um, uh, volunteers. So nobody is earning any money from query DSL. And you, as uh, in employees, you know, you have to find a way to monetize open source. And Chuk find that way because Chuk is not entirely free. If you're using an open source database like I do, Postgres, for example, then it's free. But if you're using Oracle database, a Microsoft SQL Server, or any of the other commercial database, then you have to pay uh, um, a subscription. And uh, that's why uh, Juke also works. On the other hand, uh, the better, what's much better with, uh, with Juke is the support of multiple databases. Because if you look at uh, this query here, um, where do we have it? I would say here, this query is free from database specific stuff. But I could use database specific stuff here as well. And Juke would emulate the function if it's not available in the target database. So that way you could use the same uh, Juke code on multiple databases like you do when you use Hibernate. That's one thing. And the other thing is uh, Vadin has, uh, Juke has a lot of support now for example, for uh, JSON or XML data structures, so to load hierarchical data in a SQL statement, that's all integrated in, in Juke as well. Juke has a lot of other stuff, like you can have a, uh, you have multi multiple callbacks when you execute the query, you can uh, do things. We, for example, we use Juke, and uh, we have a kind of a UI builder integrated where the customers can, um, change the behavior or the look of, of the UI. And we capture the SQL statement that uh, Juke is generating, store them in the database, and then we can re-execute them if you migrate the database, for example. And Juke can generate the code from multiple sources. So uh, here in my case, I use Flyway. I could also use Likibase as a, or any other tool that has SQL statements. Um, and then it uh, generates data from, from uh, the SQL statements, but I could also use any database that is supported to generate the meta model from. So I really like, uh, like Juke. And the best thing about Juke is Juke has a great blog. Um, you should, uh, if you don't know yet, you should go to juke.org on the blog and you will learn a lot, not about Juke, but a lot about SQL. So Lucas said the main contributor of, of Juke uh, is very active in that space and is a SQL expert. Uh, you ca can ask him anything about SQL. He knows more or less anything that uh, that is possible. And uh, to finish uh, my answer, uh, Juke will support reactive programming model in the next version. So you can use R2 DBC as drivers, and then you also have this non-blocking uh, SQL execution. You don't get that with Creedia. So. Great, yeah. Uh, I, I think you could say uh, a very good, uh, it's a good match for, for writing flow applications, uh, kind of share the philosophy of writing, of writing Java. Um, there's a question about uh, the source code. I guess it's gonna be available. Sure, I didn't have it included, but if you go to GitHub, 72 services, it project is called Vadin Performance. Uh, I put it in the chat here, you can share it. Uh, with the audience, everything is here. Uh, by the way, if, you, if you're if you using that, uh, the first uh, start will be more than half a minute because it will execute the 17,000 uh, SQL statements in the first run. And therefore you should use uh, Postgres database. You could also use it with H2, but every time you will start it and you have an in-memory database, you have to wait half a minute. 
So maybe it's better to create a database. That's very simple. Uh, the best is to use Docker to run it. That's very easy. And then you can create a database Vadin with the user Vadin and grant all privileges. We don't uh, bother if this is a good idea or not here. It's just a demo. And then you can run it from, from, uh, from the command line or from any tool. By the way, I borrowed, borrowed that from start.vadin.com. Uh, the readme just uh, adjusted it for, for my example. 